The Bozeman Trail, the history and legacy of the exploration route that led to Red Cloud's War. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Bill Hare. Introduction. The Bozeman Trail. When the great father at Washington sent us his chief soldier to ask for a path through our hunting grounds, a way for his iron road to the mountains and the western sea, we were told that they wished merely to pass through our country, not to tarry among us, but to seek for gold in this far west. Our old chiefs thought to show their friendship and good will when they allowed this dangerous snake in our midst. They promised to protect the wayfarers. Yet before the ashes of the council fire are cold, the great father is building his forts among us. You have heard the sound of the white soldier's axe upon the little piney. His presence here is an insult and a threat. It is an insult to the spirits of our ancestors. Are we then to give up their sacred graves to be plowed for corn? Dakotas, I am for war. Red Cloud Even before the American Revolution, Americans traveled west. From the narrow strip of the thirteen colonies, across the Appalachians, ever westward they journeyed, and by the end of the nineteenth century, the United States of America stretched from sea to shining sea. Of course, just because the names on the borders changed, it did not tame the land or its previous residents. Americans desired California and Oregon, going to war for one and nearly going to war for the other. Once acquired, it now fell to the salt of the earth to settle these claimed lands and everything in between. To do this meant crossing terrain unused to the heavy traffic of Westerners on the move. Though Indian trails followed rivers, hills, and valleys across the plains, Westerners often needed to create new paths capable of handling the heavier traffic and bulky covered wagons. At the same time, safety often required avoiding the natives. Though sometimes co-opting Indian trails for this purpose, oftentimes pioneering settlers worked to avoid such routes as well, especially when the natives took exception to their new neighbors. From this need came two adventurers, determined to find a path north to the latest gold rush at the end of the road. Though such trails already existed, these two men forged a new trail, one that would bring a great deal of woe to the local natives. Why build such a trail through such a tumultuous land, exacerbating already tenuous relations with the natives, and even souring those of the few the United States could call allies? As is often the case with such questions, the answer begins with geography, the greatest boon and bane to adventurers since mankind first started traveling. The Bozeman Trail ran through the Powder River country, which included the traditional hunting grounds of Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Attempts by the natives to prevent encroachment and armed defense of settlers along the trail led to conflicts in short order. Shortly after the Civil War, the U.S. found itself engaged against the Sioux, in what came to be known as Red Cloud's War, and after a series of battles, including the notorious Fetterman Massacre, the ongoing hostilities ultimately convinced American officials to head back to the negotiating table with the natives. As a result, Red Cloud has often been labeled the only Indian chief to win a war against the Americans. The Bozeman Trail, the history and legacy of the exploration route that led to Red Cloud's War, analyzes the forging of the trail and the impact it had on the region. The Trail with No Name Though there was some debate after its founding regarding the trail's length, the Bozeman Trail's accepted start is Fort Laramie in Wyoming and ending at Virginia City, Montana. Ironically, in order to aid in westward travel, the Bozeman Trail actually traveled east. The Bozeman Trail itself was based on older trails long trodden by local Indians, and is not only easily navigable, but well watered and foraged, crossing six large rivers including the North Platte, both Bighorns, Yellowstone, and finally the Missouri River. Thanks to these rivers and relatively flat land well grassed, the trail's selection is easy enough to see from a geographic sense, especially taking into account the skirting of the nearby Bighorn Mountains. Forging a trail through such open lands takes time, of course, 
and, as is usual when the whites and natives clashed, a great deal of blood was shed. At the same time, before the Bozeman Trail had its name, a very similar path was used by the natives, who, as time would tell, did not like sharing their road with uninvited guests, especially ones who stuck around long after their welcome. Long before men from Europe even knew there was land west of the Mississippi to covet, the natives had long traveled well-worn paths through nature. Like the old roads before interstates, these routes moved with the land, allowing travelers to water, forage, and rest when they needed to, without veering from the trail. The Bozeman Trail was no exception to this rule, and that's what caused such problems. The local natives, residing in the Powder River country, traversed by what would become the Bozeman Trail, were originally the Crows. Such was their association with the land that early fur traders of the time called the land what the Crows called themselves, Absroka. A Crow chief once said to a trader in the region, There is no country like Crow country. A trader long used to the area said in 1855 that the land was perhaps the best game country in the world. Inevitably, that land was desired by other tribes being forced westward by advancing white settlers. And as the 19th century wore on, the Crows would find several tribes encroaching on their lands along with whites. The Bozeman Trail would only exacerbate these issues, but before it existed, few whites traveled through the region. Most people traveling west either followed the Missouri River to Fort Benton or took the southern route from Salt Lake City, one of the earliest routes west across the Great Plains. Most of these routes had their own issues. The Missouri River became a favored ambush point of the Sioux, and the Salt Lake route was 450 miles longer than what would become the Bozeman Trail. Most of the traders before the opening of the trail were fur traders, and that trade grew critical for the Crow as time passed. So too did trade for firearms, as the nearby tribes put pressure on Crow lands augmented by weapons purchased by traders. While fur and firearms traders were welcome, gold prospectors were not, and unfortunately it was the latest gold rush that brought two failed prospectors to search for a new route north. Two failed prospectors traversing these lands would forge a new era in relations, and in the process they would attempt to establish a new trail safe from Sioux raids. Their names were John Jacobs and John Bozeman. At that time, traveling west from the settled land east and along the Mississippi River before the continent-spanning railroads was dangerous at best, foolhardy at worst. Indian raids, hostile land, and long unending nothing hounded the brave souls traveling west like vultures, which also circled above when not on the ground pecking on the latest hapless traveler. To protect themselves and their wares or supplies, traders and settlers started traveling in great wagon trains, utilizing the strength of numbers to travel in something resembling safety. Prior to the Oregon Trail, many settlers and traders utilized the old Santa Fe Trail, where these wagon caravan pioneers dug the first great wagon grooves into the land. The more northern Oregon Trail suited the needs of those traveling to the new northwestern lands, whereas the Santa Fe Trail ended, unsurprisingly, at Santa Fe, New Mexico, from whence the settlers and traders heading west would find themselves in southern California. By the 1840s, the Oregon Trail was a major road for settlers, branching off as needed to the north and south to link up with the remains of older trails. Slowly, the Oregon Trail acquired forts and other posts for those using it to resupply and find shelter if needed, thus creating one of the greatest western routes in American history. What the nation lacked, however, was a link from this great trail to the northern plains, a land rich in resources but just as difficult to travel as the west. It was this dream for a northern trail that compelled Bozeman and Jacobs on their journey. Their journey began from Bannock, a bustling mining camp in the Montana Territory. In the winter of 1862, they set out from Montana southward to find a shorter route for prospective miners and settlers. The customary routes for such pioneers involved either heading north up the Missouri River or west on the Oregon Trail until heading north at Fort Hall, then onward to Virginia City. Both routes were long and risked the ire of the locals. 
Bozeman and Jacob's adventure reads much like any great exploration story of the Great Plains. Barely had they set out before hostile Sioux took their horses and supplies, forcing them to face the open winter landscape on foot. Somehow they survived to reach the Missouri River, and in the spring of 1863 their fortunes turned for the better. Commandeering a wagon train, Bozeman set out to retrace his steps in an effort to find his new trail. West of Fort Laramie, in lands that would some day hold that promised trail, he once again ran into the locals, who declared he and his wagon train had no right to cross their land. Forced to withdraw, this seemingly innocuous encounter was but the first clash of whites and natives within the lands of the Bozeman Trail. The wagon train proceeded to take the long way to Montana, but Bozeman did not join them. Determined to find his route, he and a small group of adventurous, deranged, or highly paid explorers pushed north from the North Platte River into hostile lands. Traveling by night to avoid Indian scouts, the small group pushed across the lands to forge a new path northward. Eventually, the group reached the divide between the Bridger and Gallatin mountain ranges, and one of Bozeman's fellow explorers named the discovered divide Bozeman Pass. Thanks to the token military presence in the area at the time, there is an intriguing account of Bozeman's trailblazing efforts, a story that many would not find out of place in the works of Edgar Allan Poe. U.S. Army Captain James Stewart recalled, Looking across the river, about a mile above us, I saw three white men with six horses, three packed, three riding. They were coming down the river, and I waited until they got opposite of us and then hailed them. They would neither answer nor stop, but kept the same course and at a little faster pace. I then sent Underwood and Stone across ahead of our pack train to overtake them and hear the news. We started to meet the strangers, not doubting that our men had overtaken them. We met our men returning without having seen anything of the travelers. We followed them for ten miles and then gave up the chase. It seems that as soon as they got out of our sight, they had started on a run and kept in ravines and brush along the creek for about three miles till they got into the hills. We found that we could not overtake them. We found a fry pan and a pack of cards on their trail. None of us have the least idea who they are, where they come from, or where they were going. As it turned out, the three riders were Bozeman, his partner, and Bozeman's three-year-old daughter, proving once again it takes a certain something to be a trailblazer. Concerned about Indian scouts, the small group avoided Stewart's men out of fear of a native assault. Eccentricities aside, the lands described in the above quote would come to be the Jacobs and Bozeman's cutoff, or as it later became known, the Bozeman Trail. Of course, naming a trail is all well and good, but if no one actually uses the trail, it is no better than a path the natives had exclusive claim to anyway. In 1864, Bozeman gathered a wagon train in Missouri and set out along his newly named trail. Meanwhile, a fellow trailblazer by the name of Jim Bridger, competing with Bozeman, gathered his own wagon train and set out on a different path, believing Bozeman's route too difficult to traverse. Now one of the West's most famous mountain men, Bridger took a route following a more curving western road that took him up and down several rivers and creeks in the region, and, though he beat Bozeman to the Yellowstone River, one of the checkpoints along the path, he also had a head start of several weeks. Bozeman's more direct route led him to the Gallatin Valley ahead of Bridger, and the two wagon trains actually reach Virginia City only hours apart. Ultimately, Bozeman's trail, which was shorter, better watered, and with game aplenty, became the major trail. Bozeman set out again in 1864 with another train, and slowly the road came into steady use. For the next several years, the trail saw limited but regular use by homesteaders, traders, and prospectors. One of the largest of these trains traversed the route in 1864 consisting of 156 wagons carrying 369 men, 36 women, 56 children, 636 oxen, 194 cows, 79 horses, and 12 mules. These were the great wagon trains envisioned by Bozeman and the whole purpose of blazing his trail. But the Bozeman Trail itself could be a nebulous entity, thanks to the open nature of the terrain. Though a broad line across the plains can be pointed to as the Bozeman Trail, the route's specific path seemed to be somewhat contentious during its brief life. 
several army commanders in the area each had their own idea of the trail's specifics at various points, and it is from these varied routes that the trail as a whole comes together. Based on its later importance for the soldiers stuck defending it, one path for the Bozeman Trail began in Fort Kearney, Nebraska, not to be confused with the later Fort Phil Kearney on the trail proper. From there, the trail headed west to Fort McPherson, then 110 miles later, Fort Sedgwick, considered by one local army officer the true start of the trail, traveling mostly west, but occasionally dipping south or north to Fort Laramie. This version of the Bozeman Trail ran substantially longer than the generally accepted path, and it mixed with the Oregon Trail at several locations. A more commonly accepted route starts at Fort Laramie, traveling mostly northwest until reaching the few forts built along the trail for its protection. Thanks to the surveys made of the trail, there are very detailed descriptions of the Bozeman Trail proper, and accurate records of its length. Beginning the trail at the generally accepted start of Fort Laramie, the distances between the forts are as follows. Fort Laramie to Fort Reno, 169. From Fort Reno to Fort Phil Kearney, 67. From Fort Phil Kearney to Fort C.F. Smith, 91. From Fort C.F. Smith to Virginia City, 281. This put the overall length of the Bozeman Trail at 608 miles. The generally accepted length of the trail tends to be around this length, and not the much longer version starting in Nebraska. Despite its naming and the beginning of its usage, Bozeman's trail was not strictly legal, certainly not during the initial part of its brief life. This is because it crossed lands that were ceded to the natives, and thus were part of their sovereign territory. The natives naturally took umbrage with the whites yet again flouting their own treaties and agreements. The Americans, in turn, pointed to an amended version of the treaty, signed at Fort Laramie in 1851, concerning those natives who were residing south of the Missouri River, east of the Rocky Mountains, and north of the lines of Texas and New Mexico, viz. the Sioux or Dakotas, Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Crows, Assiniboines, Grovant, Mandans, and Arikara. Pointing specifically to Article 2 of the treaty, it stated, The aforesaid nations do hereby recognize the right of the United States government to establish roads, military, and other posts within their respective territories. The treaty also established the borders of the Crow Indians, consisting of the lands around the Yellowstone River and its tributary, the Powder River. In other words, the Bozeman Trail legally ran through Crow country, at least according to the American government. At the time, the Crow were one of the friendlier natives in the region, thanks in part to the fact that the U.S. came to their defense against the more hostile Blackfeet and Sioux. The Sioux in particular often raided against the Crows, and Americans for that matter, an issue that would come to a boil sooner rather than later. For Bozeman himself, sooner turned out to be mid-April in 1867. Having set out with a partner by the name of Tom Coover, they headed down the Yellowstone River to Fort C.F. Smith, only to have their horses stolen by raiding Indians. The next day, the two encountered more natives, whom Bozeman believed to be friendly crows, but they were actually exiled Blackfeet, residing with the crows. The Blackfeet shot Bozeman twice, killing him. The Bozeman Trail's trailblazer and namesake lay dead, and his partner demanded retribution. In Virginia City, he appealed directly to the U.S. Army, stating in a public appeal, On the 16th inst, accompanied by the late J.M. Bozeman, I started for Forts C.F. Smith and Phil Kearney. After a day or so of arduous travel, we reached the Yellowstone River and journeyed on it in safety until the 20th inst, when in our noon camp on the Yellowstone, about seven miles this side of Bozeman Ferry, we perceived five Indians approaching us on foot and leading a pony. When within, say, 250 yards, I suggested to Mr. Bozeman that we should open fire, to which he made no reply. We stood by our rifles, ready, until the enemy approached to within 100 yards, at which Bozeman remarked, These are crows, I know one of them. We will let them come to us and learn where the Sioux and Blackfeet camps are, provided they know. The Indians, meanwhile, walked toward us with their hands up, calling, Apsaraka, Apsaraka, crow. They shook hands with Mr. B. and proffered the same politeness to me, which I declined, 
by presenting my Henry rifle at them. And at the same moment, B remarked, I'm fooled, they're Blackfeet. We may, however, get off without trouble. I then went to our horses, leaving my gun with B, and had saddled mine when I saw the chief quickly draw the cover from his fusee, and as I called to B to shoot, the Indians fired, the ball taking effect in B's right breast, passing completely through him. B charged on the Indians but did not fire, when another shot took effect in the left breast and brought poor B to the ground a dead man. At that instant I received a bullet through the upper edge of my left shoulder. I ran to B, picked up my gun, and spoke to him, asking if he was badly hurt. Poor fellow, his last words had been spoken some minutes before. He was stone dead. Finding the Indians pressing me and my gun not working, I stepped back slowly, trying to fix it, in which I succeeded after retreating, say, fifty yards. I then opened fire, and the first shot brought one of the gentlemen to the sod. I then charged, and the other two took to their heels, joining the two that had been saddling B's animal and our pack horse, immediately after B's fall. Having an idea that when collected they might make a rush, I returned to a piece of willow brush, say four hundred yards from the scene of action, giving the Indians a shot or two as I fell back. I remained in the willows about an hour, when I saw the enemy across the river, carrying their dead comrade with them. On returning to the camp to examine B, I found but too surely that the poor fellow was out of all earthly trouble. The red men, however, had been in too much of a hurry to scalp him, or even take his watch, the latter I brought in. After cutting a pound or so of meat, I started on foot, on the back track, swam the Yellowstone, walked thirty miles, and came upon Mackenzie and Reshaw's camp, very well satisfied to be so far on the road home and in tolerable safe quarters. The next day I arrived home with a tolerable sore shoulder and pretty well fagged out. A party started out yesterday to bring in B's remains. From what I can glean in the way of information, I am satisfied that there is a large party of Blackfeet on the Yellowstone whose sole object is to plunder and scalp. Yours, etc. Signed, T.W. Coover. Gallatin Mills, Bozeman, April 22, 1867. As luck would have it, there was a preserved native account of the same incident dictated by a Crow interpreter in 1896. In the year 1867, about the last of May or the first of June, I was at Fort Laramie in the service of the government, and here the tribe of the Crows were at that time gathered for the purpose of signing a treaty with the government. At this time a war party of young bucks, Crows, set out from the vicinity of Fort C.F. Smith for the purpose of stealing horses from the settlers in the Gallatin Valley. With this party of crows were five Pygan Indians, one of the largest offshoots of the Blackfoot tribes, renegades from their tribe at that time, among them being Mountain Chief and three sons, one of whom was named Bull. Being successful in their raid for horses, the band started on their return with about two hundred head of horses and had reached a point six miles below Mission Creek and about sixteen miles east from the present town of Livingston when they met two white men traveling up the river. One of these was J. M. Bozeman, and his companion, I have learned, was T. W. Coover, one of the discoverers of gold in Alder Gulch. Not wishing to harm the whites or to be harmed by them, the crows passed on, but the Pygans shortly disappeared from among them, which fact was not discovered for some time. The latter not putting in an appearance for some time, the crows started back to hunt them up, and found that they had killed Bozeman while away. The Pygans returned to camp with the Crows, but in November returned to the Pygan tribe in northern Montana. Afterwards, during the following years, the three sons of Mountain Chief, together with two other Pygans, set out as a war party for the purpose of stealing horses from their former friends, the Crows. They were discovered by a band of Crow warriors under the leading warriors of the Crow tribe, Pretty Eagle and Ball Rock, in the Judith Gap in Judith Basin. They intercepted them and killed five of them. They were recognized by the Crows as the sons of Mountain Chief, who had just left their camp and who killed Bozeman. Of course, accounts recorded decades after the fact did nothing to quell tensions in the present day. A newspaper in Union City, Montana Territory, posted in October of 1867 how Bozeman was murdered by Indians that were sons of a chief who professes to be at peace with the whites, he does the part of diplomacy while his sons and followers rob and butcher. <laughs>
Such tensions between the natives and Americans were not new, obviously. But the local Crow were considered relatively friendly, and the murder of a prominent American often proved a prelude to war. Prelude to War Before the Bozeman Trail gained its name and American travelers, the land originally belonged to the Crow, and it still did afterward, according to the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie. However, the Crow were not alone on the plains, and their lands were enticing to other natives. Several other tribes encroached upon the Crow's lands, and by the time the Bozeman Trail earned its name, those tribes had forced them west, beyond the Bighorn Rivers. Among the encroaching tribes, the Sioux were the most persistent, aggressive, and expansionist, allying with other local tribes in their efforts to take the rich Crow lands for themselves. It was this alliance that forced back the Crow. By 1864, the Crow had other encroachers on their lands as well. With additional pressure from the Blackfeet, the Crows found themselves at the edges of the Buffalo lands, bordered by hostile tribes and facing American settlers and prospectors traveling through their richest game areas. The Whites, at least, were just passing through, and that, along with their mutual enemies, the Blackfeet and Sioux, meant that, if not an alliance, then at least the two groups could form a détente of sorts. The Crow did not accept whites blindly, though. Fur traders, long accustomed to dealing with natives and considered by some whites to be effectively native themselves, were welcome within Crow lands. Settlers, and especially prospectors, were not, and even on the brink of losing their lands, the Crow assaulted prospectors in 1863, killing one of them. In general, though, before the Bozeman Trail, as long as the whites passed through Crow lands quickly, they were left alone. Even after the Bozeman Trail's creation, the Crow did not initially react, mainly because the majority of the trail crossed through lands taken by other tribes. However, the new residents of the Powder River country, the Sioux, did not take kindly to whites traversing their new real estate. As early as 1864, travelers were advised not to traverse the Bozeman Trail except in very large wagon trains. The U.S. Army also suffered. That year, a Captain Townsend and several soldiers set out along the trail with a wagon train. The Sioux attacked the train, killing four of the soldiers in the assault. In response to Sioux raids along the trail, the United States Army closed the trail in 1865 to mount the Powder River expedition against the Sioux Alliance that kept ravaging settlers and the beleaguered Crows. With the Civil War nearing its end, spare men were hard to come by, but still the Powder River expedition prepared, commanded by Brigadier General Patrick Connor. Charged with keeping the roads and trails of the plains open, Connor's expedition was war in all but name. Under-equipped and without enough men, the expedition turned out to be little more than a series of limited skirmishes, fortification construction, and requisitions for more men and materiel. Given three divisions to complete his task, General Connor made the best of the situation. Each division was given a region under their control in order to better operate over vast stretches. The Eastern, or Wright Division, with Colonel Nelson Cole commanding, was charged with marching from Omaha, Nebraska, along the north end of the Black Hills, through the northern boundaries of the trail, linking up with Connor and the Middle Division. The Middle Division, with Colonel Samuel Walker commanding, would march from Fort Laramie to the Black Hills, linking up with the Eastern Division, before joining with General Connor. The Western, or Left Division, under the direct command of General Connor, would march along the length of the Bozeman Trail itself, at the end of which the General expected to link his three divisions together. Almost from the start, the expedition faced trouble. The various division commanders had foggy notions of which parts of the Powder River country they were to march through, with the varied surveys of the region not helping. The biggest problem, however, was the soldiers' refusal to march. Occurring at the climax of the American Civil War, the expedition's soldiers expected to be discharged and allowed to return to their homes, not stuck in the middle of nowhere fighting another battle. Dissuaded from mutiny with the help of artillery, the various divisions finally got underway in July. The expedition faced vast open country, and that, coupled with lack of supplies, logistics, and communication beyond runners and scouts, 
quickly took their toll. Men succumbed to scurvy, and the East and Middle Divisions failed to link up on schedule, thanks largely to the lack of proper surveys of the region and general lack of knowledge of the terrain. This lack of knowledge resulted in supply failures, further exacerbating the expedition's plight. With the soldiers lacking food and a region sparse of forage for anything except oxen and birds, the natives pounced, attacking the separated divisions. The natives' attacks were a rude awakening for the soldiers, as among the three divisions only the Indian scouts had knowledge of the area or experience fighting in the west. Expecting nearly nude savages flinging spears and arrows, the natives' use of rifles and captured army uniforms took them completely by surprise. Despite the lack of supplies and the Indian raids, the Middle and East Divisions managed to link up in early September. But as the United Divisions marched onward to join with General Connor's division, 225 horses and mules died from heat exhaustion, starvation, or cold, thanks to a recent mountain storm. With the loss of pack animals, the soldiers had no choice but to burn excess equipment, lest it fall into the hands of the natives. However, before the soldiers could dispose of the extra equipment, the natives, clad in American uniforms, attacked. After repelling the natives, the soldiers proceeded to burn or bury whatever they could not take with them. By the middle of September, the divisions working off sixty days' worth of rations, after traveling for eighty-two days, most of them barefoot, faced continued assaults from the natives as they marched almost in desperation to complete their missions. Traveling across the terrain barely crossed by white men, the expedition would have at least succeeded in performing a great surveying of the region if a surveyor had been present. Poorly prepared, planned, coordinated, and executed, the expedition finally concluded its duty at Fort Laramie in early October, both divisions doubling back to avoid annihilation. The great success of the expedition consisted of the surveys for the construction of three forts planned to bolster the defense of the Bozeman Trail. In the end, these forts would only prove to exacerbate tensions. Both the natives' view of the expedition and General Connor's offer an idea of the end result. The Indians, thinking that the commander had voluntarily retired from their front, again hastened to the road, passing General Connor's retiring column to the east of his line of march, and again commenced their devilish work of pillage, plunder, and massacre. General Connor himself is reported to have stated in regard to the expedition, You have doubtless noticed the singular termination of the late campaign against the Indians. The truth is, rather harm than good was done, and our troops were in one sense driven out of the country by the Indians. I am more solicitous for the honor of the service than I am for my own. I do not feel sore over the treatment accorded me, but think the policy of the government toward the Indians mistaken and very unjust to the Western people. Declared a resounding success, the Bozeman Trail reopened in 1866. Though the Sioux preyed on travelers along the Bozeman Trail across their new domain, as mentioned earlier, the lands were still recognized by the 1851 treaty as Crow territory, and initially the influx of traders benefited the Crow. As a natural consequence of the antiquated treaty, loss of Crow land, and the rising power of the hostile Sioux, the federal government gathered leaders from the local tribes in an effort to ratify a new treaty. Recognizing how far west the Crow now resided, they were not invited to the negotiation table for the new treaty. At the same time, the Army continued fortifying the three new forts in the region, Fort Reno, Fort Phil Kearney, and Fort C.F. Smith. Fort Reno, originally named Fort Connor, after the expedition's commander, began construction on August 14, 1865. An officer at the fort's creation wrote in his diary, The Powder River is at this point a very rapid stream, water muddy like the Missouri. Timber very plenty, ranging back from the river from one half to a mile. Grass not very good. No chance to cut any hay anywhere near the river. In June 1866, Colonel Henry B. Carrington surveyed the area to see if he could find a better place for a fort. Finding none, he set to work bolstering the fortification, renaming it Fort Reno. The first fort along the trail after Fort Laramie, this fort's role in the coming years would remain marginal, serving as a vital, if unremarkable, gatekeeper for the trail's entrance. Fort C.F. Smith, 
placed roughly halfway along the trail, would have a much greater role. Established on August 12th, 1866, under the orders of Colonel Carrington, the fort found itself far removed from any other civilization. Fort Phil Kearney lay 91 miles to the east, and Virginia City nearly 300 miles to the west. The fort's complement faced a vast open landscape, and the fort fortunately provided a very good view to observe. An early sign of how stretched and isolated the army was in the region is indicated in a report from someone who resided at both Forts Reno and Phil Kearney. According to this resident, from the day I landed at Reno and Phil Kearney, Fort C.F. Smith was an unknown quantity. From February 20th, 1867 until April 26th, 1868, not a word came from there except once, when a party of crows came to our fort, about 40 of them, with pelts and skins to trade. The Indians reported all quiet at Fort C.F. Smith. As the previous quote foreshadows, Fort C.F. Smith would play a vital role in the later story of the Bozeman Trail. It was Fort Phil Kearney, however, that drew the ire of the natives and precipitated the looming conflict. Built under the direction of Colonel Carrington, Fort Phil Kearney's construction began July 15th, 1866. The largest, most heavily garrisoned of the three new forts, it stood as a monument to the might of the army and their intention to defend the Bozeman Trail and the plains in general from native assault. The fort was strategically located near the Piney River, where forage grass, fresh water, and timber lay aplenty, and its strategic location also rendered it a grave insult to the natives, for it rested in the heart of a rich gaming area. Fort Phil Kearney earned the nickname the Hated Post on the Little Piney, and it would play a prominent role in the looming conflict. The Start of Red Cloud's War Red Cloud did not just appear onto the scene to crusade for his people's land and way of life. Dubbed at the time the Red Napoleon of the Plains, Red Cloud rose as a prominent war chief of the Oglala Sioux, thanks to his prowess as a warrior. An impressive skirmisher, his skills earned him a following with the young warriors, but his true prominence would come when the Bozeman Trail gouged its way through the heart of the Buffalo Range. Had it not been for a disastrous example of bad timing on the part of the Army, what was to be known to many Americans as Red Cloud's War might have been averted. While the Army negotiated for safe passage along the Bozeman Trail, they were simultaneously building forts and importing detachments of soldiers to heighten protection for settlers. In the few periods when Red Cloud was of a mind to join negotiations, some off-putting examples of American might appeared at the most inopportune time. For example, in the winter of 1865, General William Tecumseh Sherman, of Civil War fame, visited the winter headquarters of Colonel Carrington in order to review the officer's suitability for relocation to Powder River with his contingent of troops. Only a few months earlier, Carrington had worked as an army surveyor, helping to prepare the Platte River region for the railroad. When he arrived in Laramie, commanding a unit of 700 soldiers from the 2nd Battalion and the 18th Infantry, Red Cloud cut short his participation in the council. Not only did Carrington's intimidating arrival constitute a stunningly ill-timed move, but his caravan was filled with supplies for building and equipping a series of forts, complete with household items for officers' families. Red Cloud stormed out in a fury, complaining that the federal government was forcing its way across the Montana Pass while requesting permission to occupy it at the same time. He subsequently declared he would not participate in subsequent councils. The Connecticut-born Colonel Carrington was largely oblivious to his unfortunate time of arrival. Under orders from Major General John Pope, The 42-year-old colonel, with no combat experience in the Civil War, was instructed to design, build, and staff several forts along the Bozeman Trail. Carrington was described by one historian as an ardent anti-slavery man whose pre-military years were spent practicing law in Ohio, with an expertise in engineering and design. He was physically diminutive, and sported long hair and a long dark beard, and the Indians took to calling him Little White Chief. By the time of his departure from Fort Laramie, Carrington had brought almost 2,000 new recruits with him, 
plus a force of three hundred Civil War veterans to help occupy the forts. With these men, Carrington ably staffed Fort Sedgwick, Salt Lake City, and Fort Bridger, and on August twelfth, eighteen sixty-six, he began construction of Fort C. F. Smith, seventy miles to the northwest. However, the remaining force with which to man Phil Kearny and the proposed wagon route around the Bighorn Mountains was only comprised of the second battalion of eight companies, barely suitable for sustaining even peacetime operations. Perhaps more than the show of force witnessed in Fort Laramie with Carrington's arrival, the presence of twelve women, eleven children, and a host of domestic items that included mowing machines delivered the final insult to Red Cloud. By the time Carrington departed Laramie in the early summer, several Indians not allied with Red Cloud warned him about the likelihood of hostile actions against his company and the protected forts. Entirely without experience in fighting on the frontier, Carrington remained optimistic, escorting 226 wagons further into Powder River country. Many of the horses and supplies intended for his use went missing before his departure. But Carrington continued to fulfill his assignment on schedule. He stopped first at the already established Fort Reno, and left a garrison there for its protection. Continuing up the Bozeman Trail for over sixty miles, he selected a suitable spot for the construction of a large fort, which he designed and oversaw through the entire process. The infamous enclosure was soon named Fort Phil Kearny, after Major General Philip Kearny, who died at the Battle of Chantilly. A few days after Second Bull Run, although Indian actions were directed against nearly all travelers and forts along the Bozeman Trail, Red Cloud, who refused to sign a non-aggression treaty, chose Fort Phil Kearny and Henry Carrington as the primary objects of his attacks. The raids, usually involving a small number of warriors, began from the first day of the fort's construction and were often focused on teams of woodcutters and arriving supply wagons. Initially, Red Cloud refused to attend negotiations regarding the Bozeman Trail. A later invitation for negotiations swayed Red Cloud, and he made the trek to Fort Laramie to once more decry the trail. Also present at the table was Colonel Carrington, preparing the army to hold the trail against native assaults. Rising to his feet and in opposition to the more favorable attitudes of less notable chiefs, Red Cloud pointed right at the colonel. And declared, "You are the White Eagle who has come to steal the road. The Great Father sends us presents and wants us to sell him the road, but the White Chief comes with soldiers to steal it before the Indian says yes or no. I will talk with you no more. I and my people will go now, and we will fight you. As long as I live, I will fight you for the last hunting grounds of my people." Thus declared, Red Cloud drew his blanket around him and left in disgust. To the U.S. Army, Red Cloud's leadership of the war against the Bozeman Trail was apparent, but locating him was difficult. In the numerous raids leading up to the Fetterman massacre, American scouts could not affirm that Red Cloud was present or whether he was leading from a safe distance. Regardless, his mark on the resistance to the American use of the Bozeman Trail was unmistakable. On July seventeenth, eighteen sixty-six, the Cazo train attempted passage from Fort Collins. Peter Cazo and Henry Arison led the two wagons with three postal employees, Cazo's Ogallala wife Mary, and four children. Camping at Pino Creek, only six miles from Fort Phil Kearny, Cazo's group was approached by a small band of Northern Cheyenne coming from a council with officers at the fort. Demonstrating no aggression, they tarried at the camp, but they were soon joined by a band of Sioux, demanding that the Cheyenne fight with them in a raid against the fort. The Cheyenne refused and were berated as cowards before eventually being driven from the camp. The incident seemed to have passed, but the Sioux returned the following morning and killed Cazo, Arison, and the three employees. Arison's wife hid in the brush with the children, and they were later rescued by soldiers from the fort. Three days after the Cazo massacre, another small wagon train was attacked by an alliance of Sioux and Cheyenne at Crazy Woman Creek, a fork of the Powder River. Unlike the Cazo train, the Crazy Woman Creek attack was defended by a unit of twenty soldiers on their way to Fort Phil Kearny. Lieutenants Daniels and Templeton scouted ahead and were attacked by a band of fifty. Daniels was killed, and Templeton escaped with an arrow in his back 
and severe facial wounds. He was able to reach the train, and the wagons were immediately circled. The whites settled in for a day-long battle, and they were eventually rescued by the arrival of a larger train offering reinforcements. By 1866, traffic along the Bozeman Trail had slowed to a trickle due to Red Cloud's efforts. The U.S. Army had no answer to the war chief's textbook guerrilla war, successfully accomplished in large part through the efforts of Crazy Horse and other young leaders of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho. Crazy Horse, like Red Cloud, was born in the Central Plains near present-day Rapid City, South Dakota. Brought up around the white man's environment, he was nicknamed Curly as a young boy. However, by the time he reached maturity, the future leader of the Oglala Sioux was hailed. As an able tactician and a determined warrior, the son of an Oglala medicine man, Crazy Horse later related a vision from his youth, declaring that he would distinguish himself as a warrior against the invading whites. As an expert in erecting strong structures for defense, Carrington had done well in selecting a location for Fort Phil Kearny, but the situation was still far from perfect. The largest and, in a tactical sense, most important facility in North Central Wyoming. It was built on good ground between the Big and Little Piney Creeks to the east of present-day Story, Wyoming, with dimensions of 800 by 600 feet. The fort's defenders had a good field of fire in every direction and good access to water. However, it was not built on the area's highest ground and was easily observable by its enemies. Carrington's logic was likely caught in a dilemma of choosing higher ground but losing access to resources. Similarly. The nearest available stands of wood were located several miles away, and every woodcutting unit venturing out came under attack on an almost daily basis. Since the midsummer of 1866 into the winter months, Fort Phil Kearny withstood 50 skirmishes with Indian raiding parties, which devised various ambushes for anyone leaving the fort. This regimen continued over a two-year period as the guerrilla war of Red Cloud and Crazy Horse. Laid siege to a generally defensive-minded American army. While raids continued against local travelers, both sides prepared their respective forces for conflict. In the process, placing the beleaguered Crow between a rock and a hard place. With their old enemy, the Sioux, on the warpath, the village elders received a surprise when several Sioux chiefs visited the Crow to establish an alliance against the American soldiers. While younger men among the Crow favored an alliance. The older crow, their long memories of the Sioux as enemies intact, decided for the time being on a tepid lack of commitment. The old animosities with the Sioux lingering in their minds, and with hopes of reclaiming the Powder River country in their hearts, the crow went to the army to discuss an alliance against the Sioux and their allies in late August of 1866 at Fort C. F. Smith. Through an interpreter, the crow warned the army of a large band of Sioux gathering for war. And also reminded the army of a treaty the Crow signed at Fort Benton, promising them a reservation where they could farm and trade. The American response was non-committal, overall, but intimated support for the Crow against the Sioux. Given papers and rations, the fort's commander, Captain Nathaniel C. Kinney, allowed the Crow to trade with the fort's resident settlers. It did not take long for the army to learn of the dissension amongst the younger Crow. And the older, who wished to remain friends with the U.S. government, for many older crow, the army was their best chance to regain their old lands now dominated by the Sioux, the lands now crossed by the Bozeman Trail. The trail now rose as a sticking point between the crow and Americans, as the loss of game along the route from travelers offset the benefits of trade. Furthermore. Despite American insistence to the contrary, many Crow felt the trail's existence lacked proper authority, having been blazed, named, and now used without the Crow's permission. With less than a thousand soldiers and a trail spanning over six hundred miles across land best described as the middle of nowhere, Carrington faced a daunting theater of war against an enemy that knew the land like the back of their hand, unable to defend a trail. That most people had the good sense not to use anyway, maintaining friendly relations with the Crow and continued support against the Sioux took priority in the war. A lieutenant by the name of George M. Templeton remarked in his journal following a council with the Crow on Halloween of 1866, "From all I can see, 
I am of the impression that if the government does not take decided measures very soon in regards to the Sioux, that the Crows will enter a league and for the first time make war with the whites. As he saw it, the lack of troops was the main issue, not only for the army to commence effective operations in the war, but also to protect and bolster the Crow and maintain their friendship. While both sides courted the Crow as allies, the war continued. In the summer of 1866, another wagon train braved the Sioux-infested Bozeman Trail, its tail repeated countless times across the plains. Reaching Fort Laramie, the train grouped together with other smaller trains and a cattle drive to bolster their numbers before moving on across the trail to their respective destinations. The train moved on without incident. The country was alive with Indians. There were signs of fighting, burned wagons, and dead stock in places, and at times the story outfit would spy on Indians at a distance. But it was not until within about ten miles of Fort Reno that there was any open hostility toward the train. As the whites neared the presumed safety of one of the trail's forts, the natives finally made their move, unleashing a hail of arrows and stealing the cattle, though they were later recaptured. Though there were no deaths, the train was forced to stop at Fort Phil Kearney, then still under construction, and the small complement of soldiers was unable to leave the fort to protect the wagon train or even finish building the fort. Halted three miles from the fort to preserve the area's forage for military use, the traveler noted the distance was too far to aid the train if the natives attacked. Forced to wait and surrounded by Indians, the train decided to take matters into their own hands. Under cover of night, the train advanced, and in the process discovered that the natives, finding the settlers repeating Remington rifles far more intimidating than the single-shot Springfield rifles of the soldiers, gave them a wide berth. Attacked at night with no loss of life and with the natives repelled each time, the wagon train waited out daylight and made sure only to travel after sundown. Eventually the wagon train managed to reach Fort C.F. Smith and the surrounding Crow, who, at this early point in the war, found neutrality better than picking a side. From Fort C.F. Smith, the wagon train continued to Virginia City without incident. While this wagon train traveled, the first major battle of the war occurred, and it was an embarrassing loss for the army that proved how under-equipped, undermanned, and underestimating of their native foes they truly were. In fact, it would be the worst defeat the army suffered against Native Americans until the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The Fetterman Massacre The first good news for the officers who wanted a more offensive-oriented policy finally came in November 1866, in the form of Lieutenant Horatio S. Bingham's Company C of the 2nd Cavalry as reinforcements. With Bingham came two infantry captains, James Powell and William J. Fetterman. Of one mind with the officers already serving at the fort, Fetterman's nature was to speak out where others would not. While every officer wanted to undertake an offensive against Red Cloud and his guerrilla raids, it was Fetterman who pushed for the extermination of all indigenous men of fighting age throughout the Powder River region, including the Bozeman Trail. Despite Carrington holding the superior rank, Fetterman was aware of General Cook's orders and that Cook had threatened Carrington with a court-martial due to missing reports that were later found to have been delayed in the postal system. Moreover, among the new officers, it was Fetterman who held the highest rank in a technical sense, since he was breveted as a colonel. By dint of that promotion, he could exercise most prerogatives of a colonel, albeit subsisting on the pay of a captain. Likely born in New London, Connecticut, Fetterman was the son of a career officer of Pennsylvania German ancestry. Five years before his posting at Fort Phil Kearney, Fetterman enlisted with the Delaware Infantry, and had received his brevet rank for gallant conduct. Fetterman was a colorful character, but reckless to some, and historians still debate the merits of his actions while at Fort Phil Kearney. For decades, biographers and historians maintained that it was Fetterman's foolishness and brash disobedience of orders that led to the ensuing massacre that now bears his name. Regardless, to say that he was critical of Carrington's defensive posture must be taken as a gross understatement. Fetterman was openly scornful of Carrington, both in and out of his presence, despite his own lack of fighting experience on the frontier against Plains Indians. 
In his correspondence, there was no veiling his sentiments. A November letter to Charles Terry, one which was later published in the Annals of Wyoming, he stated unequivocally, We are afflicted with an incompetent commanding officer. He added optimistically that the general belief among the officers held that Fort Phil Kearney would be relieved of him in the coming reorganization, he going to the 18th and we becoming the 27th Infantry. Throughout November 1866, Red Cloud raised the intensity of his raids as Fetterman continued to express contempt for Carrington and his tactics. In a search for any maneuver that might tempt, provoke, or enrage, raiding parties were surprised to see how susceptible army troops were to pursuing decoys into ambush situations. Taunts and gestures by a few warriors approaching either the fort or the woodcutter trains were often enough to draw the desired response. Groups of women inside of the fort mocked officers already laboring under an unaccustomed restraint imposed by their commander. However, the most effective maneuver involved small parties appearing to confront troops before suddenly fleeing as a tactical feint. Such simplistic staging appealed directly to the Americans' misperceptions of possessing the upper hand, a failing which would result in repeated heartaches for the troops. Red Cloud's warriors played the ruse well, where the army did not. In mid-November, Fetterman received permission from Carrington to prepare his own ambush and draw a sizable number of the enemy into firing range of what was intended to be a superior force. In one of many such underestimations, Fetterman was surprised to see the enemy sniff out the trap and make off with a bunch of army cattle to the opposite bank of the Powder River. The stakes were raised again in early December. Crazy Horse and Red Cloud reasoned that if decoy tactics were so effective against woodcutter patrols, they might serve equally well against larger forces. Joining in the plans for a raid on December 6th was Little Wolf, who had counseled peace and signed the Laramie Agreement. However, he was irreconcilable over the massacre of Sand Creek and thus bent on retribution. Black Shield and White Bull shared the sentiment, supporting the increased scope of future raids. On the morning of December 6th, a wood train was attacked, as it had been repeatedly since the Army's arrival, and Carrington's lookout tower, built on nearby Pilot Hill, was effective in alerting the fort to danger. A detail of thirty cavalrymen was sent out to relieve the woodcutters under the command of Fetterman and Lieutenant Bingham. To that point, the scenario was much like every other day at Fort Phil Kearney. However, in an unusual display of forthrightness, Carrington himself led a force of twenty-five mounted infantry out of the fort with Lieutenant George Grummond as his second in command. Carrington planned to have Fetterman drive the attacking decoys away from the wood train and toward the infantrymen circling around Lodge Trail Ridge, where the retreating enemy would be cut off. All went well in the beginning. Fetterman reached the wood train in short order and sent the attackers retreating toward the location where Fetterman believed Carrington to be. However, Carrington and Grummond had not yet arrived at the appointed spot. The second sign of trouble appeared when Bingham's cavalry became dangerously strung out, isolating the men, many of whom were inexperienced. A general panic arose within the cavalry as the fleeing Indians inexplicably turned on them, now able to attack soldiers individually, as they were too far from immediate support. To complicate matters, Bingham himself suddenly galloped off in a different direction for an unknown reason, leaving his confounded men behind. One theory claims that he was going to the rear lines to rally the troops, but the more likely scenario suggests that he set off in pursuit of a small group of Indian decoys. Regardless, he was soon cut off from his own men and from Fetterman's force. Unable to fight his way back, Bingham was felled by a barrage of arrows. The next misstep in a series of misfortunes for the troops saw Carrington become unexpectedly engaged in a separate skirmish to the north of Lodge Trail Ridge. He was able to weather the attack and eventually meet up with Fetterman on the Bozeman Trail in the Pino Valley. Grummond had made the same serious error as Bingham by going his own way and finding himself cut off after pursuing a phantom force. He was fortunate to find his way back to Carrington by hacking through a large force with his saber. Once reunited with their commanding officer, the collective found its way back to the fort, 
They considered themselves fortunate to have only lost Bingham and two sergeants, with four soldiers wounded. The Indians suffered ten dead. Red Cloud's forces were not discouraged at the failure to inflict greater damage on the opposing forces. Now operating under the assumption that pursuing decoys represented an allure the American cavalrymen were unable to resist, they resolved to continue the tactic at regular intervals. For Crazy Horse and other chiefs, a belief emerged that the strategy might work against the fort itself. Carrington, with no battle experience in either the Civil War or frontier fighting, was likely rattled by the daily anxiety and suspense. However, he probably saw the larger picture better than his subordinate officers, and he issued orders prohibiting anyone from pursuing the enemy over Lodge Trail Ridge for any reason. That order was tested less than two weeks later, when the wood train was again attacked on December 19th. The relief force was sent out under the command of Captain Powell, who followed Carrington's order to the letter. The attacking decoys were driven off, but no subsequent pursuit was offered. Once again, the Sioux Alliance shrugged off the result and prepared another decoy attack in a few days. The next raid occurred on December 21st, which saw Crazy Horse and his fellow chiefs employ the same tactic as seen in all the previous raids. Red Cloud recalled in hindsight that he had consulted a tribal hermaphrodite said to possess special powers before the battle. As Red Cloud stood on the butte overlooking the projected battlefield, the half-man rode his pony in a crazed manner in four separate maneuvers between the butte and Lodge Trail Ridge. Following each pattern, he drew his hands to his face, palms upward, before continuing. He explained to Red Cloud that with each drawing of his hands, he was scooping up the lives of U.S. Army soldiers, and following the final repetition, he claimed that one hundred blue-clad soldiers would be killed on that day. On the morning of December 21st, nearly two thousand warriors concealed themselves along the road to the north of Fort Phil Kearney, as the wood train left the fort for the pine stands at approximately 10 a.m. The attack by the Indian decoys commenced an hour later, involving only a small band of warriors. As he had two days earlier, Carrington gave command of the relief party to Captain Powell. What happened at this point is still a subject of debate, aside from the fact that Brevet Colonel Fetterman eventually led the rescue unit out of the fort. It is suggested by many that Fetterman pulled rank on Powell, but either way there's no doubt Fetterman was displeased by Powell's willingness to obey the non-pursuit order. Equally clear was that Fetterman wanted an immediate fight to end the conflict once and for all. He was already a notable figure at Fort Phil Kearney for an extraordinary boast he made before the entire company. With eighty men, I could ride through the whole Sioux Nation. According to eyewitness accounts from the fort, Fetterman was out of sight within minutes. Unaware of the large number of enemy warriors waiting over the ridge, and with the unusually sizable force under Fetterman, Carrington likely assumed that he had sent enough firepower to protect the woodcutters and drive out the raiding party. Needless to say, Carrington was underinformed. Frontiersman Jim Bridger, who as a rule avoided the region altogether while trading, had counted up to five hundred lodges encamped at the Tongue River. Although such a number did not represent the entire force of the Indian Alliance, most of the Miniconju Sioux and Northern Cheyenne arrived at the encampment behind Lodge Trail Ridge on the previous night. Based on the Army's previous experiences, fifty to one hundred would cover the retreat of the decoys leading soldiers farther over the ridge where they would meet a body of no more than one hundred warriors, as in previous raids. Given that assumption from a tactician's standpoint, Fetterman's action was not entirely irrational. Technically, however, when Fetterman crossed the ridge, he was clearly in violation of his orders, if such orders to avoid pursuit at a certain distance were actually given. What finally happened is still a matter of debate, but the end result is not. Exposed and cut off, Fetterman's entire contingent was slaughtered. For their part, the natives lost about sixty, and some of their casualties were the result of friendly fire. The Aftermath of the Fetterman Massacre Quickly dubbed the Fetterman Massacre by the United States press, 
the consequences of the engagement quickly stretched out across the plains. As the New York Tribune and other papers sensationalized the massacre half a continent away, no one in the journalistic world seemed able to get the facts right, any more than the army could. Another publication claimed that the battle took place at the very gates of the fort, with the victims screaming to get in while those behind the walls watched. In Margaret Carrington's writings, later used by the investigation panel, a series of eyewitness articles were cited, written by individuals who could not possibly have been near the fort or known anyone who was. The only absolutions offered were handed down by Commissioner Louis V. Bogey, who put out a statement that friendly Indians should remain disassociated from the event and treated gently, and that even the attackers were rendered desperate by starvation. President Andrew Johnson ordered an immediate investigation, which resulted in the eventual withdrawal of American forces from the Powder River region and from the Bozeman Trail. The investigation, urged on by the embarrassment suffered by the military branches of the United States, asked a host of unanswerable questions and arrived at a body of conclusions that were often not entirely supportable. In the initial phase of the proceedings, Fetterman was cast as the victim, but many suggested that Carrington, seeing his career suddenly endangered, turned to paint Fetterman as an arrogant fire-eater. Pro-Carrington figures characterized Fetterman as being contemptuous of authority and scornful of the fighting capabilities of the Plains Indian, despite or because of his inexperience. The subject of Fetterman's boast loomed large as each witness expressed his or her memory of it, and the sentiment began to shift, painting Fetterman as reckless. Margaret Carrington's journal claimed that Fetterman declared, shortly after his arrival, a company of regulars could whip a thousand and a regiment could whip the whole army of hostile tribes. She added that both Captain Brown and Lieutenant Grummond strongly seconded the boast and that the officer corps was filled with much parlor bluster, what she termed as patriotic pedantry. At the same time, by reminding the readers that the American army officer viewed himself as an elite of society and that grandiosity among the ranks was a common personality trait, Margaret Carrington unwittingly supported Fetterman's personal nature as being nothing out of the ordinary. Colonel Carrington's only memory of Fetterman's boast was that he declared, I can take eighty men and go to the Tongue River. When the Bozeman Trail was closed, one experienced traveler remarked, Last year the Reno and Phil Kearney route was pronounced open for immigration, and hundreds of graves along its entire length with the Phil Kearney massacre as the central figure attest how the promise was kept with the immigrants. This year it is accepted as hostile and impassable. Another consequence of the massacre was that it forced the Crow's hand. As a result of the humiliating defeat at the hands of the Sioux, many Crow leaders feared the army would abandon the forts along the Bozeman Trail, leaving them to the mercy of Red Cloud's allies. At the same time, the army's defeat did not bolster the Crow's confidence in the government's ability to even protect them in the first place. The Sioux, in return, warned the Crow to flee the area around the forts, lest they become fully embroiled in the war. This placed the Crow in a serious quandary. On the one hand, their token support of the army by serving as messengers and scouts placed them under Sioux fire. On the other hand, the Crow despised the Sioux, and though they refused to serve as messengers after the Fetterman massacre, those who had aligned with the Sioux broke off relations with their old enemies. This strange middle ground was partially solved when Captain Kinney directly hired ten Crow scouts and spies, separating their actions from those of their tribe. Despite repeated warnings, the Crow remained around Fort C.F. Smith, and the Sioux in turn left them alone. Captain Kinney noted at the time that the Crow's presence at the fort may very well have saved it from a fate similar to Fetterman's, for, as he revealed earlier, there were plenty of hostile natives along the trail to cause trouble if they desired it. Still, the winter of 1866-67 was relatively peaceful, likely thanks to the harsh plains winter as much as anything else. As the season warmed, the American Army's Crow scouts proved how safe they felt in the region ignoring their courier duties to scout and report buffalo herd movements, something far more important to them than the war. With the coming of the buffalo, so too came the natives, and hostilities quickly picked up as the weather warmed. 
Throughout the winter, the U.S. government attempted to initiate peace with Red Cloud's Federation, but he rebuffed them each time. To the Sioux leader, there would be peace when the whites left the Powder River country and abandoned the Bozeman Trail and the hated forts, not before. Thus, the war continued, with the Crow maintaining their precarious neutrality while the army fought and died to maintain the Bozeman Trail. Though the Sioux and their allies never attacked Fort C.F. Smith proper, the surrounding areas were fair game, and on August 1, 1867, a force of roughly 500 Cheyenne attacked a group of 30 civilian hay cutters outside the fort. Cut off and surrounded, the civilians managed to keep the natives at bay, inflicting light casualties before the natives retreated. The next day, the natives attacked the area surrounding the resupplied Fort Phil Kearney, surrounding a group of woodcutters, but ultimately retreating once more. Though it could be argued the natives lost both these battles tactically, the Bozeman Trail remained officially closed, which for the natives was, of course, the point. Native accounts of Red Cloud's war are relatively sparse, but there are several accounts from American sources, and one source went into detail on what's now known as the Wagon Box Fight. As a participant in that engagement, a soldier who was part of the escort from the fort explained how the local contractors formed a corral to protect their livestock about six miles west of the fort, using the boxes from their wagons to form a primitive enclosure to herd the animals at night. The corral, situated close by the woods and the tents, held a large supply of ammunition, so that in the event of attack, the workers could rally to the corral for defense. On August 1st, following the Hayfield fight, a sergeant questioned the woodcutter's escort to see if they had seen any Indians. The soldiers replied they had not. Though in the night pickets saw nothing, one of their dogs repeatedly ran down the hill, barking and snapping furiously. The dog's instincts and the picket's hindsight proved the natives lurked in the darkness, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Shortly after the participants started his morning picket duty, around 7 a.m., that moment arrived. Alerted to the presence of the attack by a shout, the soldiers readied themselves for a battle as seven mounted natives approached from the north in single file, chanting a war song along the way. Having been just issued new rifles, and having yet to fire them in anger, the soldiers took care to adjust their sights and ready their weapons for battle, a fault with army training and supplies throughout the Indian wars. After taking their shots, the pickets looked toward the camp and saw to the foothills toward the north more Indians than we had ever seen before. With no orders to move, the pickets decided to retreat to the corral, utilizing a simple staggered volley fire as they headed for safety. It did not take long for the natives to bring their own weapons to bear, and the soldiers who left the account barely got the drop on a native with a Spencer carbine, who fired a shot that just missed him while the soldier downed the native. Still the pickets ran, joining with one of the contractors in their retreat, while the natives increased in numbers at such an alarming rate that they seemed to rise out of the ground like a flock of birds. Though the natives rushed to cut the pickets off from the corral, the small group got within firing distance, and thanks to one of the sergeants sallying out to provide covering fire, managed to reach the corral's limited safety. Finding the escort company's commander, our participant wheezing for breath, explained why he abandoned his picket station without orders, a crime normally punished by firing squad. The captain lauded the man for his efforts, declaring, You'll have to fight for your lives today. Thus rallied, the soldiers and civilians prepared to fend off an unknown horde of natives, their only defense, government-issue wood boxes, in the same style and construction that was used in the Civil War. The natives came, and the soldiers opened fire as the Indians circled and galloped around them, firing bullets and arrows at the defenders. Despite increasing casualties, the natives' attack continued, and the defenders kept up their fire until finally the natives gathered their dead and withdrew. They returned not long after, however, utilizing the cover of the tents near the corral to block their assault. Risking enemy fire, our participant and several others sallied from the corral to down the tents and open the soldiers' field of vision, and thus their field of fire. The battle continued into the afternoon, with water and ammunition running scarce and fire arrows threatening the corral. A massive assault of natives on foot threatened to end the fight in their favor, but the soldiers' fire slowly turned them around. 
On the brink of being overwhelmed, the natives, unused to Western-style fighting and preferring less costly skirmish combat, broke and fled. Our participant noted that throughout the battle, Red Cloud himself observed on top of a ridge due east of our little improvised fort. A large portion of the remaining soldiers opened fire on the observing war leader, but missed, hitting the warriors scattered below him instead. Finally, with the rallying blast of a howitzer from Fort Phil Kearney heralding reinforcements, the natives withdrew for good, having sustained heavy casualties while inflicting far fewer in number than they received. Despite these kinds of battles, as well as official warnings and the actual closing of the trail, some enterprising, if foolhardy, traders still braved it, some even successfully. A trader by the name of Nelson Story took advantage of the fact that the natives stole horses instead of oxen, the primary beast of burden used to haul wagons across the various trails westward, to supply C.F. Smith throughout Red Cloud's War. For the duration of the war, Story managed to successfully trade with the fort unmolested, though this was in part because he never traveled east of the fort, where the Sioux ran rampant. For the Crow, the use of couriers seemed to tip the hand of the Sioux, not only frustrated by the Crow's friendliness to the Army, but also the Army's continued presence in the Powder River country, despite their best efforts. While war raged on in the plains, the federal government authorized a commission to meet the natives in July 1867, marking another attempt to end the war. The commission failed. Bolstered by the success of the Fetterman massacre at the war's onset and further emboldened by a lack of reprisal, Red Cloud's war continued and intensified. While peace commissions to Red Cloud failed, other commissions bore better fruit. In the winter of 1867, the Secretary of the Interior formed a committee to investigate the causes of Red Cloud's war, both to see if it was worth the cost in lives and to investigate the validity of rumors of Crow involvement in Fetterman's massacre. Exacerbating the issue, the settlers of the Gallatin Valley near the trail, though never assaulted or threatened by Red Cloud's forces, continued to clamor for increased military presence and protection. While the committee deliberated, the Honorable Judge John F. Kinney traveled west to meet directly with the Crow. Kinney, stationed at Fort Laramie, had some trouble convincing the Crow to leave the safety of Fort C.F. Smith, but eventually the two sides met at Fort Laramie, though the Crow, suspecting Sioux hostility against them, refused to travel further south. Kinney arrived on May 31st, only to discover most of the Crow delegation departed for a buffalo hunt, its timing possibly hastened by a Sioux raid that had succeeded in capturing over forty Crow ponies. Kinney's arrival marked a watershed for American relations with the Crow and Sioux. Crow neutrality had upset the Sioux and lowered the confidence of the Army in one of their few native allies. Fort C.F. Smith received a new commander, Lieutenant Colonel Luther Bradley, who looked on the Crow's supposed neutrality with suspicion. Kinney, meanwhile, heard out the Crow's precarious plight, learning that while the Crow would fight their old enemy, the Sioux, Lakota aggression required they reopen negotiations for a more formal truce with their fellow natives, lest they earn Red Cloud's wrath. Sympathetic to the Crow's plight, Kinney recommended the Crow receive extended protection from the U.S. government, as well as rations and reimbursement for horses lost in Sioux raids. Most importantly, he advocated returning the former Crow lands back to them. It should be noted this final recommendation did have the now familiar ulterior motive of meaning the Bozeman Trail would be within the hands of a presumably friendly native tribe. Though the Crow hated the trail as much as any other tribe, Kenny may have hoped that increased American support could temper the Crow's feelings about it. As a further gesture, Kenny dispatched an interpreter and trader to join the Crow camp to help deflect Sioux overtures. Based on subsequent Crow actions, it can be surmised they responded positively to Kenny's overtures, bringing them closer to the Army and further from their Sioux enemies. Crow intelligence was critical in the string of victories in early August of 1867, especially the Hayfield fight and Wagon Box fight. Despite such victories as the Wagon Box fight, the war continued, and native skirmishing tactics proved their worth when it came to forcing the Army to abandon the forts and leave the Bozeman Trail to its original owners. Unfortunately for the Crow, 
Sioux aggression grew too powerful to ignore. Kenny's delegation and a handful of loyal Crow remained, while the bulk of the tribe quietly slipped away from Fort C.F. Smith. Despite Kenny's best efforts to sway the Crow fully to the American side, the tribe maintained neutrality in fear of Sioux retribution. The conclusion of Kinney's Crow delegation was that unless the U.S. committed sufficient troops to attack Red Cloud's forces offensively, rather than holding up defensively in an increasingly impotent gesture of defiance, the Crow would abandon the Americans. Fortunately for the Americans, Sioux hostility overcame Army impotence, and the Crow formally sided with them against the Sioux. Unfortunately, the previously mentioned committee seemed willing to acknowledge the Sioux conquest of the Powder River country, rather than the old land claims outlined in the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty. Some even spoke of abandoning the Bozeman Trail altogether, though such talk occurred before the victories in early August. Kenny, seeing the return of the Powder River country as the first step to civilizing the Crow, continued to advocate in their favor. In July of 1867, Again, before the victories in August, a commission was formed with the stated goal of negotiating an end to Red Cloud's war. While the commission was organized, it sent word to the tribes to meet at Fort Laramie, something many of the younger Crow vehemently opposed. With summer slowly giving way to autumn, the Crow also grew restless to begin preparations for hunting for winter, something the rampant Sioux could easily hinder. Still, the Crow continued to support the army, delivering the mail between the forts, for a hefty sum of $33.33 per month. All the while, with Sioux running rampant across the country, the Crow faced the real possibility of starvation from the inability to hunt in safety. To bolster their native allies, the U.S. supplied the Crow with cattle and flour to support them through the winter as the autumn of 1867 became the winter of 1868. The Commission's efforts to gather tribal leaders bore fruit in November of 1867, thanks largely to the Sioux's willingness to suspend hostilities so the Crow could make the 327-mile trek to Fort Laramie. As a prelude to further negotiations to end the war, the Commission started negotiating revised formal dealings with the Crow. The U.S. opened negotiations by suggesting the Crow sell their lands in exchange for farming, building supplies, and teachers so that your children may become as intelligent as the whites. The delicate matters of the Bozeman Trail and Sioux control of former Crow lands never came up at this early juncture, though the negotiators offered to allow the Crow to hunt on the lands so long as there were buffalo to hunt. The Crow response was a vehement reminder of the damage done to the land and game by the Americans, of animals hunted down to deprive the natives of them, or forests cleared for settlers and forts, and lands scorched for farming. Concluding his impassioned speech, the Crow leader Bear's Tooth rhetorically asked, If I went into your country to kill your animals, what would you say? Rejecting the notion of civilizing that the whites offered, the Crow leaders made clear their suspicions when it came to signing any more treaties with the Americans. They also made clear their dislike of the Bozeman Trail, stating to the commission that they should recall your men who have camped all along this trail and all those who seek for gold, they are the cause of all our wars and misfortunes. Reiterated passionately over three hours, the first meeting of the commission with the Crow did not go as well as the commissioners had hoped. The two sides continued back and forth, with the commission adamant that the Crow select a reservation, while they still had a choice in the matter. But the Crow remained equally as adamant that they would maintain their traditional lifestyle as long as the buffalo roamed the plains. Offered a treaty the Crow refused to sign on three grounds, the lack of Sioux present at the negotiating table, the treaty's failure to mention closing the Bozeman Trail, and the fact that not all Crow leaders were present to discuss the treaty. Reaching a stalemate, the Commission took minor solace in managing to obtain an agreement to reconvene at Fort Phil Kearney in the spring of 1868. Before Red Cloud's war, the Crow desired the removal of the Sioux from the Powder River country, but now the Crow merely desired the closure of the Bozeman Trail as condition for their continued support and friendship. This change in view reflected the increasing tension between the Americans and the natives. As the Americans put pressure on the natives to civilize, the Crow pushed back with a desire to keep to their old ways. 
The Bozeman Trail represented everything the Crow grew to dislike in their American allies, most notably the scattered game, a, a land gouged by wagon wheels, and an increased military presence. Such was the state of relations that closing the trail became more important to the Crow than reclaiming the Powder River country. In this regard, the Crow had more in common with Red Cloud's alliance than with the American government. Despite the common ground, the Crow remained firm in their opposition to the Sioux, and as 1867 turned to 1868, the American government once more prepared for peace. Lacking the manpower to defend the trail in its entirety, and unwilling to forsake what little good will remained with one of their few native allies, preparations began for another peace conference to end Red Cloud's War. This time, the Americans were willing to close the Bozeman Trail and permanently abandon the three forts in Powder River country. Reaching Fort Laramie on April 10th, the peace conference contained the American delegation, Crow leaders, and representatives from the Cheyenne and Arapaho. Notably absent were Red Cloud and his Sioux allies, who refused to appear until well after the three forts were abandoned. One by one, the three forts emptied. Fort Reno succumbed to a mysterious fire not long after its evacuation, with little remaining but a few walls and scorched earth. Fort C.F. Smith, once a bastion of U.S. Crow relations, also emptied. Finally, Fort Phil Kearney, the hated post on the Little Piney, where the war began and some of its greatest battles were fought, was also evacuated, also succumbing to fire shortly afterward. With the progress of the Union Pacific Railroad westward, the Bozeman Trail became obsolete, and so the trail returned to its native owners, a wagon trail once more a game trail. The 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie set the boundaries of the reservations in and around the Powder River country, and it further stated that the United States now solemnly agrees that no persons except those herein designated and authorized to do so and except such officers, agents, and employees of the government as may be authorized to enter upon Indian reservations in discharge of duties enjoined by law, shall ever be permitted to pass over, settle upon, or reside in the territory described in this article. The treaty also included standard declarations for support infrastructure and tradesmen, requirements of educating children, relinquishing lands beyond the reservation, and eventual transition of the natives into landowners, as such treaties often did. The Crow, incidentally, found themselves more or less hung out to dry, for the treaty expressly granted the Powder River country to the Sioux, abandoning the long-time goal of reclaiming the Crow's old homeland. The new treaty reduced Crow lands from the 38 million acres of the 1851 treaty to 8 million acres. In exchange, the American government agreed to provide an agency, doctors, teachers, four years of provisions, and aid in transferring from a nomadic lifestyle to agriculture. The 1868 treaty left a bitter taste in many mouths. The soldiers from the forts felt betrayed by the government that abandoned the forts they'd fought and bled to defend. The Crow felt betrayed for their lost lands, though they also took solace in the closure of the Bozeman Trail, a sore point in relations since the trail's forging. By November of 1867, Red Cloud recognized that he could not sustain his offensive against so many of the enemy, carrying such improved weaponry. However, he also understood the waning spirit of the U.S. military commitment to the Bozeman Trail and the larger Powder River region. Red Cloud was the last of the Native American leaders to sign this treaty, which allegedly guaranteed that the Lakota Sioux would own the Black Hills, Pahasapa, of South Dakota in perpetuity, and that the area would be set aside for Native Americans only. Whites could not enter the territory without the express permission of the Sioux, which was essential, because the Black Hills are the holy land of Lakota and other indigenous peoples. Following the years of protracted siege against Fort Kearney, Red Cloud returned to a quieter life. He was the first and last of the Native American chiefs to win a war against the United States. Though the victory would not last... The immediate results spoke for themselves as the forts were gone and the trail was closed. With the Union Pacific Railroad's construction protected by the treaty, the need for the Bozeman Trail ceased. The coming of the railroads rendered the various trails more or less obsolete across the plains. The Bozeman Trail, soaked in the blood of natives protesting it, soldiers defending it, and even its namesake, 
now later returned to the land and the natives who claimed it, unmolested by pioneers, soldiers, or prospectors. A Not-Quite-Empty Trail Following the closure of the Bozeman Trail, the fate of the natives is not hard to guess. Their reservations shrank, and those seeking to travel west did so by railroad. Prospectors and other settlers flouted the Great Sioux Reservation's borders as impudently as ever, and it was from this behavior the true story of the Bozeman Trail reveals itself. Blazed by prospectors for prospectors, the Bozeman Trail tells a tale of cultural clash, war, and ultimately failure. Though brief in existence, lasting barely five years and being closed for two of them, the trail's mark on history and the land had an impact as deep as the wagon gouges dug into its ground. The Bozeman Trail cost soldiers' lives in the aftermath of the deadliest war in American history, fractured good feelings with one of the few native tribes aligned with the government, and exacerbated the hatred and anger felt by other native tribes. The Bozeman Trail's legacy was mostly one of death and betrayal. That said, it is also a tale of the pioneer spirit, for the Bozeman Trail, like other similar trails, rose from a need to travel west and fill the land so that America could truly stretch from sea to shining sea. Before the country could be filled, those who lived there first had to be shoved out of the way, and the fact that the Bozeman Trail witnessed one of the few times those who were there first managed to push back, even if briefly, makes it all the more important. While the Bozeman Trail officially closed in the 1860s, there is a 20th century account of the path of the Bozeman Trail to C.F. Smith. Comparing its description to those that came before, it's clear that there were many changes made to the trail after the natives' victory. From Fort Laramie, the Bozeman Trail took a generally northwesterly course, and upon nearing the Powder River, followed down the long ravine known as the Dry Fork of the Powder River. This Dry Fork, crossing on the Powder, is still well known and used, although it has never been successfully bridged and has varied almost a mile in location, owing to the ever-shifting and sliding banks of that stream. From Powder River, the trail still used much of the distance to Crazy Woman's Fork, although the crossing of the latter was a mile below the present bridge at the Traving Post Office, 18 miles southeast of Buffalo, Wyoming. As Fort Reno was located about four miles below the Dry Fork Ford, from 1865 there was a much-used road leading down the northwest side of Powder River to the fort, and again back from the fort to the trail toward Crazy Woman. This distance of almost 30 miles from Powder River to Crazy Woman has remained practically unfenced, and the Bozeman Trail, along with various recent roads, is used today. From Crazy Woman to Clear Creek, the present road almost follows the course of the trail, past the Wallows, for sixteen miles to the Big Spring at the Cross H Ranch. At this point, where the lane now runs directly north into Buffalo, the trail passed off to the northeast, and followed along low ridges, through what are now the Cross H and Foot Ranches, coming down to a crossing of Clear Creek a mile below Buffalo. Through these ranches, although much of the trail has been plowed and under cultivation for twenty-eight years, wherever the native sod is unbroken, the grass-grown tracks are readily traced. Across one ravine, where a large irrigating canal has absolutely obstructed the use of the road since 1883, the tracks are plainly indented in the sod. The Clear Creek Ford is still in use by the ranchers, and is known as the Hamilton Ford, because a man bearing that name lived on the west side of the ford. From this ford, the trail runs toward the northeast, past the Frank Gruard house, and over French Creek, and then up the hills, just northeast of the Johnson County Fairgrounds, and down into Rock Creek Valley, thence up the valley for about half a mile to a ford now in use just below the Mathers and Munkers house, and on past that house through the gap in the divide below. From Shell Creek to Piney, few traces can be found, but it is well known that the trail followed the general course of the present county road, varying but little, except where the lanes are now twined out around corners of fields. The Piney Crossing was little more than a quarter of a mile upstream from the present iron and cement bridge. The road up onto the Prairie Dog, Massacre Hill Divide, ran through the same gap as at present. Along the summit of Massacre Hill, the trail ran northward, and down that natural hogback 
to a point on Prairie Dog Creek below the present bridge, and back of the building on the Banner Ranch, thence to the north of the present lane and between the Big Butte and the pond on the Terrell Ranch, then to Pomp Creek in practically the same course at present traveled. Here the trail crossed to the southwest of the present road, and through a gap in the hills to the south of the Payne Ranch, thence along the western divide down to a ford on the west fork of Mead Creek, a quarter of a mile south of the present bridge. This stream, though small, has a very muddy swampy bed difficult to ford or bridge. This old original crossing is found to be inlaid with rocks. Through gaps in the hills the trail passed on down to Cruz Creek, running off to the northeast of the present upper road. Cruz Creek was crossed near the West Gate House, and then to avoid the abrupt hills west of the valley, the trail ran down the valley north for over a mile to the low gaps in the hills one mile east of Bighorn, where the present county road runs. Thence the trail crossed into the Little Goose Valley to a ford west of the Sackett Barns. This ford has been fenced up for thirty years and so little used that no proofs are left for newcomers, but fortunately a few old-time freighters remember and agree. Thence the trail ran up to Jackson's Creek Valley and passed over the Beaver Creek Divide through the gap to the William Meaner Ranch on Beaver Creek, near the county bridge. To the northwest, the trail then ran as directly as possible for a point on Big Goose, long known as Beckton, from the fact that the Honorable George T. Beck, Cody, Wyoming, was the pioneer rancher of that section. The next stream, Soldier Creek, was crossed just above the present P.K. Ranch. Wolf Creek was crossed near the present county road and Tongue River at the upper crossing, where Dayton is now situated. Five Mile Creek was crossed near the present Five Mile Schoolhouse and Pass Creek near the buildings on the Peter Reynolds Ranch, the north line of which is the Montana State Boundary. Thence, just northeast, Twin Creek was crossed on the Zachary Ranch. Then the old trail, unfenced and but little changed, runs on through the Crow Indian Reservation to the Bighorn River, and is used occasionally by Indians and Roundup wagons. The fords on the Little Bighorn, Lodge Grass, Rotten Grass, Soap Creeks, and Warmans are all distinct. Across the valley of the Little Horn, the trail is visible for many miles as it winds up the divide on either side. Warman Hill is a very long, steep descent, and here the road has been worked and graded in recent years. Tradition places the trail on the first long hogback north of the present road, and as all loaded wagons would have been pulled down grade, this is very probable. Fort C.F. Smith, after it was built, overlooked and guarded the Bighorn Crossing. Today, the Bozeman Trail is commemorated with historic markers and modern highways roughly follow its historic path. Interstate 25 in Wyoming, Interstate 90 from Wyoming to Montana, a scant 30 miles from the city that bears the trail's name, and U.S. Route 287 roughly form a modern Bozeman Trail. They all appear as modern indications that despite the setbacks the Americans suffered there against the Sioux, the trail, like the West overall, eventually was won. This has been The Bozeman Trail, the history and legacy of the exploration route that led to Red Cloud's War. Written by Charles River Editors. Narrated by Bill Hare. Copyright 2018 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2018 by Charles River Editors.